Lord Arbathorn's balls were legendary. His Christmas ball was considered the crown jewel of London's social calendar and the highlight of the festive season, where the great and good would gather on the eve of the last Saturday before Christmas to wine and dine in an environment of unabashed opulence. My cousin Clarence had, of course, secured his invitation, and I was to accompany him, being the closest thing he had to a friend in all the world. And even I was not so fond of him, but that I felt obliged. For we were family, and his father, having been my guardian upon my own parents' early death, there was always a sense of obligation to my younger, quote, sibling, unquote. How would one describe Clarence? He was supremely handsome, but equally vain, charismatic, but reprehensible, self-obsessed and shallow. Had we not been related, he would undoubtedly have been best avoided, but he was alone in the world, quite alone, since his mother died, though not without good reason. Still, here I was, his one and only constant. On this occasion, I had tried to dissuade him from attending the seasonal event for the sake of his reputation. He was having none of it. Reputation be damned, was his response. We were standing in the drawing room of his plush central London apartment that bleak afternoon, as the December night drew in early and a smattering of snow began to fall. His manservant, Haggard, having closed the curtains, stoked the fire, and having then served us each with a generous brandy, closed the door behind him, and left us quite alone. I began my entreaty. I cannot fathom, Clarence, how you could even entertain the idea of attending Lord Arbuthorne's ball tonight, after what has happened so very recently with the dreadful death of poor young Annabel Vogel. And what is it to me? I gasped. But you know that dear sweet girl would never have poisoned herself, would not even now be lying cold and stiff in her lonely coffin if it was not for you. Oh, Willard, I cannot be held responsible for the actions of a disturbed mind, if indeed a mind she had, and not a pea, rattling around in that pretty little head of hers. Didn't the coroner conclude that she committed suicide as a result of chronic melancholia? Clarence, for pity's sake, Annabel was always a delicate creature, but if she did go out of her mind, it was you who tipped the balance. Me? How so? Am I to be so blamed for being irresistible to women? By leading her to believe that you reciprocated her affections before casting her aside like an old boot, as soon as Ellen Arbuthorn came of age, have you even considered what people will say if you do go to the ball? Let them say what they please, Willard. I will not have my plans disrupted by the machinations of a deranged dead woman. And besides, I have already promised my dearest Ellen that I will attend. I have already secured several dances with her, and she will be quite inconvenienced were I not to go. I paused gravely. Tell me honestly, cousin. Did you speak to Miss Vogel of marriage? Well, he considered, I told her I'd bought a ring, and come to think of it, she did seem quite disappointed when I told her that it was for someone else. At this point he took a small velvet case from his waistcoat pocket, and opening it, flashed the dazzling diamond solitaire set on a band of gold. I plan to propose to Ellen this very night. Wish me luck, he winked. I shook my head. So that is why Annabel resorted to arsenic. Utter despair and degradation. A terrible, painful, unholy death, I fear, lies squarely at your feet, Clarence. Oh, come now, he retorted. Don't be such a misery. Of course I am not unmoved. I am heartily sorry she is gone. She was a wizard at bridge, as you know. But let us be realistic. One cannot be expected to throw one's considerable charms away on a point of charity. The point you seem to be missing, cousin, 
is that you actively encouraged Annabel Vogel in her attachment until Miss Arbuthorne became eligible, and then you swatted her away like a troublesome fly. Clarence frowned. Your observation is not complimentary, cousin. We both know what flies are attracted to, do we not? I softened my tone and attempted to sound more conciliatory. I do not wish to imply that you were that you were responsible for her death, only that you were guilty of administering the fatal dose of poison yourself through a lack of fellow feeling. There are times, dear cousin, when I do wonder if you really have a heart, or just a clockwork pendulum in operation. For I, for one, cannot get dear Annabel out of my mind. And I, retorted Clarence tartly, for clearly my words had ruffled his peacock feathers, I, for another, do not give her a single thought. He had hardly spoken these words before we were shocked and startled by a loud screech and the mighty explosion of glass in the bay window. The violent gust of winter wind that followed, causing the curtains to billow, the gas jets to flare and dip in their sconces, and the flames of the open fire to leap and crackle ferociously up the chimney stack. Dear God, what was that? I cried as we both ran to inspect the damage. And there, there on the carpet, lay a mutilated seagull, its neck broken upon impact with the glass, its feathers bloodied. Damn it, they're taking over the city, you know. Why, only the other day young Harker was dive-bombed in Westminster. Needed stitches. The council needs to sort it out. It's the filth that attracts them, I observed. We both shuddered involuntarily as a gust of frozen air swirled around us, threatening to penetrate the flesh and freeze the marrow in our very bones. Despite the upset and my entreaty, Clarence remained insistent that he be present at the Christmas ball, being quite resolved to make his proposal to Miss Ellen Arbuthorne. And so on that very evening we entered the carriage that would take us the relatively short distance to the venue. Surrounded by walls and situated just off Park Lane, Arbuthorne House was a very grand residence indeed, not so much a house as a private palace. Designed and built in sandstone around 1720, the impressive exterior boasted a three-storey, nine-bay by five-bay main range, while the rest was two storeys high with an orangery to the side. The breathtaking interior was designed in tribute to the finest of Italian styles, its most impressive feature being the grand staircase which dominated the centre of the house in a great balconied hall that rose three full storeys. It was there and in adjoining rooms that the ball would take place, and all bedecked in glittering Christmas splendour. We had no sooner handed over our hats and coats than a glass of champagne was placed in our hand, and with Miss Ellen Arbuthorne yet to make her entrance, Clarence wandered off to mingle with some fellow parliamentarians. I stood off to the side of the hall, listening with pleasure to the string quartet as it played its Christmas repertoire. It was then that I was accosted by an acquaintance, the dowager Lady Harriet Felton, an elderly matron renowned for her sharp tongue, bawdy sense of humour and rumoured predilection for handsome, young, stable lads. Always outspoken and very decided in her opinions, I greeted her cordially and braced myself for the worst. My dear, she observed whilst fanning herself, I have no patience with the young ladies of today. Why, these days a girl will lay herself down at the feet of the object of her affection only to be trampled on, and foolish enough to imagine it is love and not a form of mental illness. Men, in my experience, are such frightful rotters, present company accepted, and are only too happy to take advantage of the befuddled I smiled in as non-committal a fashion as I could muster. Lady Felton raised her pince-nez to her eyes and gazed across the hall, focusing on Clarence and his cronies who were laughing heartily. I wasn't expecting to see your cousin here tonight. And in such a jolly mood, too. I can't be the only one. I thought he would be bereft at the loss of his betrothed. 
It was a question, not a statement, and she turned her eyes in my direction for an answer. Ah, oh, well, they were never betrothed, Lady F. Yes, she rejoined, unconvinced, and returned her gaze to Clarence. Still, I can quite see the attraction he has for women. The noble profile, the broad, muscular chest that is barely contained by his waistcoat, those powerful, meaty thighs. I assume his fashionable attire is bespoke. From Savile Row, I believe. And kept to fit him perfectly. Those trousers do leave so very little to the imagination. In the moment, something untoward occurred as I felt as if I could see Clarence through a woman's eyes, laughing without care, glorious in his masculine beauty and vitality and surrounded by a halo of gold. And I found myself questioning my commitment to him, my concern for his reputation. Was I just another conquest of sorts? The unwelcome thought was interrupted by a collective gasp that went up from the assembly as all eyes turned to the top of the stairs. Standing there, fashionably late, was the vision that was Ellen Arbuthorne, clad in a ball gown of yellow silk, her golden tresses artfully arranged around a beauteous visage, stood the eighteen-year-old goddess, poised and waiting to be admired. And then came the shrill shriek of another demented gull, as it burst through the arched window beside her, glass shattering and scattering in all directions. Ellen stood, her arms outstretched in alarm, her face a vision of shock and horror as the crowd below gasped again, though this time in utter disbelief. There followed such a draught, blowing harder and deadly cold through the broken panes. The wind swirled and whistled about the fragile figure. It increased in force raised her voluminous skirts, tore at the lace on her trimmings. It snatched at her golden tresses, wrenched them away from their accoutrements that held them in place. One long lock was lashed across her face, then the hair completely released swirled up above the girl's head and stood freakishly on end. Then, with sudden force, as though pushed violently from behind, and with a scream of abject terror, she tumbled head over heels down the first flight of stairs. She hit the landing head first, but the momentum did not stop as she bounced up again, landing awkwardly astride the marble banister. The congregation below could only look on in horror as she sped down the further two flights at breakneck speed. Clarence, to his eternal credit, raced to the foot of the staircase and reached out to grab the hurtling figure as it flew off the bottom rail and landed in his arms. Alas! The velocity of her landing carried them both through the open French doors and into the orangery which shattered upon impact, killing them both upon the instant, chopped by glass shards into a thousand pieces, never to be separated. Several years have elapsed since that dreadful day, and Christmas has never felt like Christmas ever since. Being impossible to disengage Clarence from Ellen, they repose in a shared grave which I am wont to visit at this season of the year. A yellow rose for her, a red rose for him. Was their fate sealed by the vengeful spirit of Annabel Vogel? Do the dead wander the earth and persecute the living? Whenever I see a seagull fly, I ask myself that question. Mm -hmm.